coming up on Outdoor Oklahoma. We'll tag along with a group of hunters near Hennessy participating in the annual Grand National Quail Hunt. We'll also learn about a unique quail research project being conducted on the Pack Saddle and Beaver River wildlife management areas. Department of Wildlife Conservation, Outdoor Oklahoma. Well, hello and welcome to Outdoor Oklahoma. I'm Todd Craighead, and today I'm joined by Doug Scholling, our upland game biologist for the Wildlife Department. Part of Doug's job is to visit with landowners around the state and, and consult them on how they can improve their habitat. Is that right? Yeah, I, uh, I'm actually out doing a technical assistance on a landowner today down here in southwest Oklahoma and, and uh, trying to help them kind of improve the quail population on their property. You know, quail hunting and quail population issues are pretty hot right now. It's a hot topic. And we've been working at the Wildlife Department on two different research projects here of late. One's called the Operation Idiopathic Decline. And then Doug, tell us about the other one we're doing. Yeah, the other one is on a couple of wildlife management areas out in Western Oklahoma, Pack Saddle um, and Beaver River. Uh, those two are, uh, conduct are done by Oklahoma State University. They are a quail telemetry study. Uh, they're trapping quail and putting radio collars on them and following those birds around. They're trying to identify kind of what nesting habitat the quail are using from different management practices like prescribed fire, uh, grazing, uh, different things like that if the quail are affected by those management practices. And we're trying to find different ways to benefit the habitat using those, those quail that are radio collared. Well, that's great. You know, the exciting thing about both these research projects is that you as the public, if you're interested in quail or upland habitat of any kind, then you can follow along and keep updated practically on a week by week basis with the research. Doug and, and some of his coworkers are uh, putting together a uh, what, it's called the Upland Update, is that right? Yeah, it's the Upland Update. It goes out about every other week throughout the year, and it's providing updates on the number of birds. We've got radio collared on each wildlife management area, different updates as uh, we get information from the field. We kind of put it on there and uh, give the public access to all that updated information kind of as we get it. Well, that's great. It's kind of live as we're doing the research, you as the public can keep up to date with us. Uh, I mentioned the Operation Idiopathic Decline, and we had a chance to catch up with one of Doug's co-workers, Gina Donnell, doing some of that testing on a uh, wildlife management area not very far from here, Sandy Sanders WMA. Today I'm joined by Gina Donnell and we're out at the Sandy Sanders Wildlife Management Area in Southwest Oklahoma. Gina, you're one of our wildlife biologists yes. concerned with quail, so yes. tell me what we're doing. Well, we are trapping quail and taking biological samples uh, for part of uh, Operation Idiopathic Decline. Okay, now that's a mouthful, it so is. why don't we stop right there and okay. explain what that means. Well, 
We are obviously concerned with the quail decline, and there's a lot of theories about what's going on. Uh, so Operation Idiopathic Decline was started by the Rolling Plains Quail Research Ranch in Texas, and they want to see if disease has any impact on the population. Uh, the term idiopathic means the doctor doesn't know, so <laughs> we're, we're just kind of testing everything that we can. Well, just great. to see if it has any impact. Well, great. And you actually trapped a quail. We trapped last a bird night. last night, and uh, we'll be taking samples in our in our traveling lab here in just a few minutes. Okay. Well, We're peeling uh -huh. the feathers back, and that the uh, right there is the jugular. Uh -huh. um, so that's what we're going to be taking our sample from. And so um, you just go ahead and draw a blood sample. Last time I went to the doctor, it took about an hour to do just that. <laughs> well, so. sometimes it's, it's easier and sometimes uh, we struggle with it just a little bit. Uh, so we put a drop in each of these four circles. And then when they get back to the lab, they will uh, be able to, to take all the samples they need from those four drops. Mm -hmm. And then we also put a drop on the slide. Now, where does this stuff get sent to? This, uh, all of our samples get sent to the Central Receiving Lab in Texas Tech uh, in Lubbock. And so they will take uh, inventory of what we send them, uh, how much we send them, and then they will split it up between, I believe there are eight separate researchers. So it's a very large scale project. Um, there's several Texas universities that will be uh, taking the samples and, and analyzing them. Uh, so it's it's a really it's a huge project, and uh, so we're just one small part of it. Just just trapping and sampling the quail is just a small part of sure. the project. I know in talking with hunters and, and concerned sportsmen that it would be easy to find a scapegoat to blame. Exactly. Like predators. Like predators or, or disease or, or disease. habitat or. But it's just not that simple, is it's it? It's not. There, there's a lot of things that affect quail. They're on the bottom of the food chain. They're small bird, they're short-lived, um, so there, there's just a lot of things coming together and mm -hmm. kind of built, making that, that perfect storm. Uh, but, you know, we hope that if we have enough habitat available, that whenever they come up out of the slump, like they have done historically, that we'll have places for, for the birds to live. <laughs> That's great. So, all right, well that is everything for this bird. So let's okay. uh, go release her at the, the trap site we, we caught her in last night, and mm -hmm. then we'll run traps again and see if we caught any more birds. Good deal. Just open up our strings here. Try to figure out which, there's her head. Okay. You want me to take the bag when you're done? I will, whenever. Okay, okay. all right, so. She's uh, ready. Turn her back out. <laughs> And one, two, three. All right. You know, Doug, I didn't grow up in this part of the state, but I never get tired of views like this. <laughs> yeah, this is a real pretty view. Uh, over here close to Sandy Sanders Wildlife Management Area in that broken canyon country mm -hmm. of southwest Oklahoma. And a lot of people might not think that this is real good quail habitat, but really it is. Uh, all this bare ground is kind of their travel corridors, getting from point A to point B with less resistance, and it helps them get away from predators and stuff like that, and also look for seeds and bugs and all that. So this bare ground is real beneficial to the quail also. Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about conservation. I'm ready to actually go on a quail hunt. How's that? That sounds good. <laughs> One of our producers, Rich Fuller, produced a segment about the Grand National Quail Hunt held every year up in Enid. And it, during that time, he followed along with a bunch of hunters that were hunting quail near Hennessy.
You know, Doug, those guys looked like they had a pretty good day, didn't they? They did. They had some real good dog work, too, and that really helps. You know, several years ago, there was a, a well, back in the 90s, we had another research project done on pack saddle concerning quail. So tell me some of the similarities and some of the differences with the current study. Well, some of the similarities are they, they, are, they do have radio transmitted birds. That's really mm -hmm. pretty much the, the main thing that they've got is they're putting radio collars on those birds. The technology has become better and they've got more battery life and, and able to get a signal from the radio collar a little bit further. Yeah. But uh, other than that, they are doing a lot of different stuff. They're looking at other stuff like weather. They're putting weather stations out on those wildlife management areas, looking at more small scale weather events that go through those areas and how the quail react to those different weather events. So what you see Andrea doing behind me is uh, setting up her radio telemetry equipment so that she can monitor some of the birds that we have uh, released with radio collars on, on the wildlife management area. And uh, this is done through the, uh, the signals that are sent out with the collar and uh, we receive them with the radio telemetry. And we use this to look at what type of vegetation the birds are using as well as monitoring survival rates. Uh, ultimately what we want to uh, look at with this research project is monitor habitat use through multiple seasons, so both the breeding and non-breeding seasons, as well as monitoring survival and mortality rates throughout non-breeding and breeding seasons. Uh, we also want to look at nesting efforts and reproduction efforts during the breeding season and we're also able to accomplish this using the radio telemetry equipment uh, that you see Andrea using here. Um, one unique opportunity that we have on the, on the Beaver River Wildlife Management Area is that we have populations of both northern bobwhite and scaled quail. And so one of uh, the key objectives of this project is to see how these two different quail species interact among the same community, uh, if they compete with each other, and just compare overall habitat use and survival rates. Uh, we also hope to uh, capture about 150 quail before the hunting season. and. Uh, once the hunting season comes in, we hope to see how hunting pressure might affect survival as well as uh, habitat use and movement patterns of the quail. This is a cooperative research project between the Oklahoma Department of Wildlife Conservation and the uh, Oklahoma State University. And ultimately what we hope to accomplish is to look at look and see how these quail are responding to management practices on the area and see how we can uh, better manage the uh, WMA so that we can increase quail populations. Uh, one of the ways that we're monitoring the densities of quail populations is through uh, bird dog surveys where we run bird dogs and try to see how many coveys we can flush during the uh, winter season. We're also looking uh, uh, estimating density through fall covey surveys and we're also doing summer male whistle counts. So we have a lot of ways to measure the density of the birds as well as their survival to see how they're responding to the management practices here. Hopefully what we can accomplish is uh, develop a plan to manage, properly manage the WMA to increase quail populations overall as well as apply this, these management techniques to surrounding landowners in the panhandle uh, that might have similar vegetation communities and uh, ultimately provide uh, a wide landscape of usable habitat that the, uh, the quail can use and, and ultimately increase uh, population levels for hunting and conservation purposes. They're putting weather probes along where the nest sites are, where the brood sites are. They're looking at temperature, relative humidity so they're looking more into the weather and how much the weather plays into what happens with the quail population along with those management practices that we're doing and seeing how they react to those different management practices that we're doing on our wildlife management areas too. Well that's great so if you're a hunter and you come across one of those it's not a bomb. No, no. <laughs> It's a weather station. That's right. <laughs> that's great. You know we'll visit more with Doug about uh, the quail research being done here locally in Oklahoma right after this week's Outdoor News Report. An essential part of any biologist's job is manipulating habitat for the wildlife. 
And every year, biologists get better and better equipment to help them do that. We're now going to visit with Ron Smith and discover a new tool that he's added to his bag of tricks. One of the newest tools that the wildlife department in the Southwest region has been able to purchase has been a tremendous benefit to us. And I think it will be something that we'll be able to make use of in a lot of different situations for habitat development. Uh, the Bobcat machine that probably many of you are familiar with and the tree saw attachment is gonna be beneficial to us in removing brush feces, removing you know, all know the plague of the eastern red cedar around the state. Other species that are invasive as well that uh, we can't, in areas where we can't manage things with prescribed burning in sensitive areas where there may be houses or property that could be threatened or in situations where terrain limits prescribed burning, we can use a tool like this and it's a very efficient tool. Once you have some hours in on it, and a little bit of experience, you can move through junipers like what we've done here. Uh, these are redberry junipers, unlike the eastern red cedar around the rest of the state. Uh, but they're equally troublesome out here on the Sandy Sanders area. We're going to be able to use this tool to open up new pockets of habitat and enhance fire guards where we can get some burning in some areas that we've never had access to burn before. And I think that's one of, going to be one of our greatest benefits to it is managing in a way that we can use other tools behind that. And this was uh, supplied through a generous donation to the wildlife department and it's been already proved itself to be very valuable and we're tremendously thankful for what it's going to do for us in upland game habitat. Well, Doug, we mentioned earlier in the show about how great that Upland update is, and this truly is the, the information age, and it's pretty exciting that landowners can have this cutting edge information available to them so soon after you get it. That's right. That's what our Upland update is. It does provide that information right off the bat. And I mean, I still provide, I go out and meet with private landowners and help them out and I'll still continue to do that. But this is how we can reach a lot more people at one time. But if people still want to get out, have us come out and, and meet with them out there on their property, we still do that. But we just want to get that information out there as fast as possible. Well, I think that's a great thing. And I encourage everyone to go to our website and sign up for the Upland Update. Hey, I got an idea. How about you and I meet here about, say, November 15th? Would that work for you? This sounds good. All right, that sounds great. Thanks for joining us today. And, and uh, if you'd like to learn more about how you can connect with your outdoor world in Oklahoma, log on to wildlifedepartment.com and also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. For everyone at your wildlife department, thanks for joining us. We'll see you right here next time on Outdoor Oklahoma.